الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين. We ask Allah to bless this gathering and to make it one in which is beneficial. We ask Allah to shed his mercy on this gathering by the blessing of those who have attended this gathering of the people of knowledge and the people of piety and those that are connected to the unbroken chain of narration all the way back through our righteous predecessors to Rasulullah uh, Tonight, inshallah, uh, is uh, the second, I think, uh, event uh, on the program of our esteemed guests this evening. And uh, first of all, I'm going to uh, introduce our uh, Sheikh and Ayad and scholar that is uh, amongst our midst, visiting uh, Sydney, visiting uh, Australia. Uh, and then, inshallah, uh, we'll uh, continue uh, with the program and uh, uh, the, the lesson. Uh, Sheikh Dr. Jibreel Fuad Haddad is a senior assistant professor in applied comparative tafsir in Sultan Umar Ali Seyfuddin Center for Islamic Studies at the University of Brunei, Darussalam. He was born in Beirut, in Lebanon, into a Catholic family and studied in the UK, the US, France and Lebanon before getting his PhD in French literature from Columbia University, New York. He was the recipient of several fellowships including one of the prestigious FLA Normal Superior, I don't know how to pronounce that, in Paris, France. He also graduated with highest distinction from the New York University Latin and Greek Institute. After converting to Islam, Dr. Haddad spent nine years of study in Damascus, in Syria. He's received ijazat from over 150 shiur. He holds a doctorate and he is the author of over three dozen books, most recently the first critical edition and translation and first book-length study in English on the first Hizb of Tafsir and Baylawi, a 900-page work to be published jointly. It's published. Oh, it's not published. It's not this is uh, a bit delayed. Uh, by UBD Press and Beacon Books in the UK, uh, many of us would have already uh, read and come across many of uh, Sheikh Jibril uh, Haddad's works uh, on the internet and in the published form. Um, and uh, some of his works include the Integrated Encyclopedia of the Quran, the Encyclopedia of Hadith Forgeries, and the Muhammadan light in the Quran and Hadith, as well as hundreds of articles, most recently, Tropology and Inevitability, Ibn Ashur's Theory of Tafsir, in the Ten Prologamana to at tahrir wa Tanweer, and Quietism and End Time Reclusion in the Quran and Hadith, and Nabusi and his book, Takmil al Nuhud, within the Ruzla genre. He is presently working on the first critical edition and translation of Ahmad Ziaduddin or Ziaduddin al umash al umash Khanawi Hadith Source Index entitled Ramuz al Hadith al Hadith. He is lectured on Quran, Hadith, Sirah, and Tasawwuf in Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, the U.S., U.K., Sweden. Lebanon, Syria, Morocco, the Republic of South Africa, Mauritius, and Alhamdulillah now, Australia. You can add that, inshallah, there to the list of the countries. Uh, the intended uh, topic, or the proposed topic for tonight, um, was one on the roles of different genders uh, within Islam, and a comparison between what traditional understanding um, within our Islamic uh, culture is with regard to the roles of men and women in society, in family, uh, in the marketplace, um, in the private and in the public spheres, um, and comparing that between what the modern day 
uh, understanding is of the roles of both men um, and women in society. So, inshallah, I'm going to leave it to uh, Sheikh Jibril to um, uh, bless us with his wisdom um, on this topic, but he's open, obviously, to, to speak on whatever comes uh, to him in, 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 in other topics, but that was just a suggested topic uh, for tonight. And uh, I'll end with uh, a hadith of the Prophet where he uh, tells us, Jalis al Kubra, Wasa'i al Ulama, wa Khalid al Hukama, sit in the company of the great ones and ask of the people of knowledge and also mix with the people of wisdom. And without doubt, tonight we have the opportunity to combine all three in our presence amongst, among our. Uh, before our esteemed Shaykh uh, Dr. Jibreel Fuad and had the Khalid the Fadl, Thaba Allah. Thank you very much for this undeserved introduction and your Husn uh, excellent, uh, optimistic, high opinion. Uh, I can only say astaghfirullah and I turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness and for inspiration in this time to come together with love of one another on the basis of obedience to Allah and love of Him and His Prophet love of the people of holiness and righteousness of the, the prophets and the awliya, the friends of Allah is uh, in itself in itself a cure and a healing for our uh, our shortcomings, our wounds in this uh, in these very troubled times that we live in troubled times is when Prophets emerged. They did not emerge in needless times, but in needy times. And it seems that this is one of the neediest, certainly in living memory, in our, li in our, in our, in our lives. Uh, it seems that every day is something <coughs> worse and stranger yet stranger than any uh, nightmarish fiction that uh, one might invent, yet this is the reality that we live in. And the Prophet وسلم, said, we begin by mentioning this hadith, to place ourselves, ourselves under its aegis, those who are merciful, the all merciful shall grant them mercy. May Allah be blessed and exalted. We shall grant them mercy. Be merciful to those on earth, and the one in heaven shall be merciful to you. Irhamu man fil abdi, irhamu kum man fil sama. So you can detect immediately the obvious features of this hadith, the repetition of mercy, mercy, mercifulness, be merciful, grant mercy. So as a verb, as an adjective, as a noun, and although it's very short, it is almost unstylistic, and yet it is full of uh, eloquence and elegance. And also the uh, Tit for tat uh, nature of reward, because that is how it is. It is our deeds is what we are repaid with in the end. This is how it works in dunya and in akhirah, in this world and the next. So, as also another hadith states, a hadith Qudsi states, it is only your deeds, O my servant. Uh, divine hadith spoken by Allah Most High. And we call it Hadith Qudsi 
is spoken by Allah, it's not Quran, but is related by the Prophet as a hadith. He said, these are only your deeds, O my servant. I'm just recording them for you. And so whoever finds goodness, uh, let him thank Allah, but whoever finds otherwise, let them blame only themselves. See, so we are almost makers of our own ultimate destiny in the hereafter. Not quote unquote makers of history as, as uh, the, the godless picture of the universe presents uh, the endeavor of mankind as pure uh, acts of, uh, of, 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 of a human being in a godless uh, universe, no. But rather uh, as uh, uh, responsible for what happens to us here and hereafter. It is the notion or the doctrine of caste acquisition. It is ethical, legal, moral responsibility for our actions. And the understanding of the message of Islam is something that we are therefore asked to, to wield and practice with open eyes and a clear mind in that respect, in mean, respect of understanding of duties that everyone understands as ma'roof, ma'roof, ma'roof in the Quran is mentioned over and over again that do ma'roof, follow ma'roof. And ma'roof in itself is what is well understandable, what is well known, what everyone uh, agrees consists in good. What everyone knows is ethical and right. Al-Ma'ruf, the well-known. So, uh, and Al-Munkar, what is disowned, what is disclaimed, what is not recognized, what is rejected, uh, to stand for, uh, respectively, the good and evil. So, it's not something that one can interpret this way and another that way. No, someone gives you a hand when you are drowning, or a piece of bread when you are hungry, or a smile when you are dejected. Everyone understands that this is goodness coming your way. This is al maruf So this is how we have to rediscover our, our faith in troubled times and the humanitarian aspect of catering for mankind as a whole, you see. Uh, the generic aspect the a-religious coloring of this duty, which is reflected in this hadith, you see, to uh, be good to mankind, to grant mercy to all on, on earth, man fill out, and one in heaven, you see, shall grant you mercy. Is, this is how we can rediscover the meaning of the specifically religious injunctions uh, that we follow and that we specialize in, in, in practicing as Muslims, which others, non-Muslims, might not, might not decipher as easily as al-ma'roof. See, so once, once this is done, then we, un we can understand better our own, uh, our own lives and identities as Muslims through helping the other, because we will find that in fact, every verse, every hadith is, is directing us in, in that direction. Not to be walled into our identity as followers of a particular religion. Uh, and that, that is just like another game of identity politics. No, but rather to become true uh, human beings. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ was described as in some uh, parts of the literature of Sufism as al insan al-Kamil, the, the perfect human being. Sayyid Muhammad bin Ali al-Maliki, one of our graceful teachers, rahimahullah, may Allah grant him mercy, passed away now, lived in Mecca, has a book by that name, Muhammad, the perfect human being. So, we are called to be perfect human beings. See, Women are not called to become perfect men, 
but rather perfect human beings patterning themselves after the character of, of the Prophet as equally as man. And that, that is not easy because our, our compartmentalized way of uh, thought and our language is full of divisions that tradition perpetuates, I suppose. And so the good side of tradition is that inside tradition also there are exceptions to uh, to rules that put us into straight jackets of gender roles. We must look at those exceptions to realize that it's not as rigid as the concept of tradition might might uh, might be telling us. And so perhaps that is the way through which we can say that uh, we are all called to were born to be exceptional and extraordinary. After all, the Prophet, on him blessings and peace, came and uh, and showed uh, pagan uh, Arab uh, Arab uh, values that which showed them wrong uh, and said, "No, there is a better way," and turned them upside down and reformed people. So he was he was not following tradition in this respect. He showed us to, to turn wrong tradition around and to follow and install and put a new tradition in place. And that included also gender roles, as I hope to perhaps we can try to, to elaborate on that further. However, at the same time, we need structures and a kind of um, directive that, the directives that are easy to follow for new generations and upcoming generations from generation to generation and this is what tradition is supposed to help with uh, so that people do not have to reinvent the wheel in terms of uh, the choices that they, uh, that they can follow in life as leaders or as just good good citizens, good teachers, good parents, good spouses. So uh, not everyone is called upon, for example, to be like some of the, the fighting women participated in the fighting, but not just as uh, nurses or as uh, helpers on the sidelines, but sometimes even carrying uh, weapons. This happened. So they can be part of the army as well, not have to be automatically, because of their gender, disqualified from that. Uh, but these, these exceptions might not, not every, not everyone, generally speaking, uh, women in general, we might say, might not be on the whole as a rule comfortable with that uh, choice. They might have be preferring to have other choices. So again, uh, what we mean to say is that we cannot say that it is just excluded. The same way, for example, to lead as scholars, we find that a lot of the men of uh, the early generations were indebted to women as their teachers in religion, and this was uh, advised by the Prophet, the common blessings and peace himself, and then subsequent generation, and in some of the schools of Islam, they can sit as judges as well. Uh, as for heads of state, that's, this is an issue that has been raised because of the hadith of Abu Bakr from the Prophet وسلم, that uh, people will not succeed if their affairs are entrusted to a woman, and perhaps this was meant uh, universally, but perhaps it's, it was meant actually specifically in relation to a specific people or a specific time. I believe that there is room there for investigation as to what exactly are the, the confines of such a hadith.
However, if we take one of the questions that we were asked to prepare before this, is there such a thing, is the thing as traditional roles of men and women in Islam? Is there such a thing as traditional roles of men and women in Islam. So this is this is a, a minefield because <laughs> and I'm not a what you call the people who are in charge of uh, diffusing minds. De mineur in French, but I don't know what term in I'm sure that there is a specific term in English as well. But I'm not such diffuser. 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 Yeah. I'm not a diffuser. So. Uh, I am the one who's uh, wondering at times if now to say to someone, your traditional role is to be whatever, dot, dot, dot. Is that acceptable anymore now? To say to someone, your traditional role is to be this? So, it is, uh, sounds to me like a straight jacket, a put down, uh, a reductionism of uh, someone who is more than that. They are more than their quote unquote traditional role. So, it, here in such a phrase, traditional is like almost a dirty word. And uh, at the risk of sounding trite or preachy, our role is to be good human beings. Again, to check ourselves and to do our best. And sometimes we are called upon to, to do something that outside our comfort zone, our traditional place, our qualification even. Uh, so this is the first principle to address such an issue. And then after that, you see that historically, as we mentioned, uh, the example of the early Muslims show us that they were stepping out of what they had received as the best values from the, or the, the traditional values, not the best values, but the, tra the, tra the values handed down, which is what uh, tradition means, something handed down, something transmitted from the past and uh, uh, usually venerated as solidly in place for a good reason and that should be perpetuated uh, because that's who we are, that's how we do things. Well, they got rid of many of those things. Islam came, submission to God and the ways of uh, monotheism for one and of respect for life and of a reinterpretation of the traditional paganistic notion of honor, tribal honor. So uh, this was tossed aside, and yet it, it, it was so much part of the definition of their identities. It was not an easy process, and yet it happened for the betterment of themselves and of humankind. So, and part of it was the roles of women respect due to women uh, as members of the society and in their familial roles as well. And now, now that we truly are experiencing also another dark time of uh, ignorance uh, in the name of religion or lack thereof, also, we, uh, we are experiencing a, a need to redefine also so-called traditional roles. And it seems to me that sometimes religion, instead of providing answers and facilitating uh, soul searching, is, is, is part of a problem indeed, and is the brick wall that we are trying to, to move beyond and or to break down. 
to say, to, to shut down uh, the search for solutions. It, the religion is being used to do that at times, and even to discourage any avenue of uh, research in this respect, in the name of, say, discouraging innovation, the bad innovation of misguidance, or, uh, or uh, to call, uh, to, to, to use bad terms, I guess. This, is, this would be immoral because this is not what uh, women are supposed to do, or what men are supposed to allow, and so, with an unthinking way. For example, uh, in uh, the, the question of hijab, for example, there is uh, places in the world where today, as we speak, uh, a person might be killed because they are wearing the hijab in the wrong way, and their newlywed husband as well because he allowed it. This was uh, mentioned by one of the deserters of uh, Daesh in a program called like that, uh, Speech of Deserters. It's a French program. It's available online at archive.org, Baron de Deserteur, the plural. Interviews with people who deserted, and they were helped out by the uh, an organization, the Raqqa, called the Raqqa Revolutionaries. Yeah. Their job is simply to facilitate people who are trying to find a way out of that, uh, that organization. And they said that, one of them said that uh, a newly wed couple was killed for that reason. So this is, this is something that not even in the Jahiliya, because Islam would have been allowed such a thing. You see, uh, for grown men and women to be killed for such a reason. SubhanAllah, those who circumambulated the Kaaba naked had more religion in them. In, in pagan times, you see, they, 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 they would remove their clothes because they would, these are the clothes in which they sinned before they repented, you see. And now, to show their repentance, they, they are making circumambulation of the Kaaba and, and and so to show that, they would shave their hair and uh, also this, uh, doff their clothes. And, uh, and then after that, they would uh, wear new clothes to show that they are discarding their old lifestyle. And these were pagans, and the Prophet, for in blessings and peace, did away with that. No more of this, these displays. But look, this was their way of uh, signifying uh, goodness and uh, an ethical posture. On the other hand, now, after the enlightenment of Islam and the, the leaving of pagan ways, we have this phenomenon taking, taking place. It can never be in the name of Islam. It can never. Islam has nothing to do with that. Islam is completely innocent of that. This complete uh, tyranny and coercion. The, the mere uh, act of killing someone, some, someone for such a reason on religious grounds contradicts the principle of religion, which is that there is no coercion in religion. Coercion is to do away with the precious gift of mind that Allah gave and insisted upon in verse after verse in the Quran, that use your mind, reflect. The goal to Islam in the Quran is all based on mind and use of the mind and reflection. The rational arguments is how Allah Most High wanted humanity to be convinced. Not, uh, not uh, spectacular feats. When they were asking for miracles, they said, there is a time for miracles. But think, observe, reflect, ponder. And uh, now they are saying no coercion, the way of coercion. And then what do they leave to the Islamophobes who say uh, that, who accuse Islam of being nothing but the way of the soul? Well, it is Islamophobia in disguise. And sometimes the wielding of the term traditional roles and we must act according to tradition and this comes in, in that fashion fashion of coercive sword over our heads 
Do or else. Be like that or else. And do not think. Don't question. No, this is completely antithetical to, to the message of Islam. If Rushd, right guidance, is patently clear and distinct from misguidance, falsehood, error, then what need do I have of a gun to my head? I'm running by myself. I'm already convinced. I do not need coercion. There is coercion means there is something missing. There is something defective. It's not working. So, now we fall back on force by force. If tradition is being used in that way, then it is a false tradition. A dark, wrong tradition that has gone astray. So, we are, it is like going back to the ways of Jairiya. And do, because this is how we found our forefathers doing things, and that's it. And this excuse in itself also is fraught with, uh, with uh, falsehood. Because we cannot claim that our forefathers in Islam did such things. On the contrary, the Prophet, upon him blessings and peace, with our mother, who is the Quran in incarnated Quran, yani he was the living Quran. His character was the Quran. As Sayyidah Aisha said, he said, you want, do you read Quran, oh my brother? She replied to someone who was asking, how was the character of the Prophet? So her, question, her answer was a question, do you, don't you read Quran? And he said, yes. And she said, well, you will find him there. His character was the Quran. His character was the Quran. Therefore, if we want to understand the Quran properly, if there is an issue, an issue over which there is controversy in the Quran, must turn, we must turn to the character of the Prophet, especially if it's an issue dealing with character. And it seems to me a lot of those gender issues are of that nature. So, we were mentioning earlier uh, this evening <coughs> the issue of the, the uh, domestic violence, for example, and in which, uh, in which Muslims, Arab Muslims even, people who are born and raised to speak in the language that the Quran illustrated, the Arabic language, but completely misunderstand it when it comes to such issues because of the the tabut, the overwhelming tyranny of tradition over their heads, which is strengthened by the demand of their own ego in the, uh, as the insider enemy of themselves. They say, yes, take it, because this is what the Quran justifies. Wife beating? Do you find that in the life of the Prophet وسلم, whose character was the Quran? Therefore, you do not. You do not. You do not and cannot. Therefore, do not say that it is in the Qur'an. What you think is in the Qur'an is contrary to that, because if it were, then you would find it in the life of the Prophet, who it, which is the illustration of the Qur'an. Not to say also, in addition to that, the proper interpretation of the Qur'an by consensus. It, cannot, it can never go against <coughs> something that the Prophet uh, interpreted in such a way to say no, and actually our opinion is different from that. <coughs> and the way that the Prophet وسلم, interpreted those verses that deal with that topic shows that he never raised a hand. Never raised a hand. And this is the uh, this this is our approach to, the, to this is our answer, not to find that not to bend over backwards trying to find ways of translating, interpreting the, uh, the verse of, of uh, uh, striking, but rather to say that the Prophet never raised a hand. And the Prophet is our pathway to the Quran. We are not people who jump over the heads of uh, uh, the people of learning 
and try to approach the Quran by ourselves, much less jump over the head of our Prophet وسلم, and try to <laughs> interpret the Quran as if the Quran would have been revealed to us. No. So, how has this impacted or been impacted by current gender roles in the world, particularly in Western societies? That's how the second question goes. Western societies allow us to hold such a meeting and to discuss freely in a way that perhaps Islamic societies we might find a problem with that. That's one thing. We are, we are lucky in this respect. We are thankful and we should make the best use of, of it. I find that there is a renewal in ijtihad and fiqh and practice and tasawwuf and perhaps new seeds of friendship and reconciliation with Allah Most High and the Prophet and remodeling of ourselves that is being allowed in such a context. That's on the positive side. On the negative side, the a religiousness the secularism, meaning militant secularism, or atheism in the sense of a militant religion of godlessness, of anti-theism also. Anti-theism might be a bit strong, because anti-theism is not, 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 not typical. Anti-theism is more like the communistic uh, societies. But secularism, and sometimes getting militant in that respect, trying to prove that everybody is everything and freedom in the absolute sense, you know, like almost in a vacuum, ahistorically and divorced of all values, uh, Western or Eastern, uh, Christian or Muslim, no religion and no uh, no anchoring in any uh, past, uh, no, uh, no tradition. That's, this is extreme. This is extreme. It's, it's like throwing the baby with the bath water and discarding everything and reinventing the wheel all over again. No, we take the good. And this is an Islamic rule as well. We take the good wherever we find it. And this is our inheritance and our property not just as believers, but as human beings. So we, our problem is with people of bad faith, not with people of no Islamic faith, people of bad faith. And that, that is found even among our sins, not just among non-Muslims. So the categories have to be redefined. And the partners that we are looking for in shouldering each other in uh, this kind of reform based on the message of Islam can be can uh, can be you know inside the Ummah it can be also among non-Muslims as well because for us it is a continuous da'wah and this da'wah is just as the repetition of the shahada that we have to do in prayer and outside of prayer all the time it is also a da'wah to ourselves but it is something that is ongoing we are all works in progress this is why in the Ash'ari school we say I am a believer insha'Allah in the Ash'ari tradition Hanafis I know they, they do not accept that they say no if, if you say I am a believer it means I am a Muslim that's what believer means. Therefore, we must not say inshallah, which is for the future, or which, which, which uh, uh, implies doubts or possibility that maybe not. No, we must say I'm a Muslim. Ash'ari say, but when you say I am a mu'min, they make a difference. Mu'min is the perfect, the final believer that one hopes to be, as they understand it, at the time of death. 
that when everything counts, because Prophet said, "Inna al bi bil that uh, actions count according to their final conclusions, to their final states. Until that time, you are still under scrutiny. You are not out of the woods." So the, the contract can be revised. See, the two buyers are still in each other's presence until the time of death. At that time, the contract is closed. There is no payback. There is no, uh, there is no exchange accepted anymore. See? So this is where we are hoping that we are saying, La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. And our saying that in life is all a long preparation for that time when it is all sealed at that time. So we said, Ya Allah, bi husn al-khatima. We always say, bi husn al-khatima, husn al-khatima. That is our rightful and good obsession, our goal, our, our eyes on the prize. And so, in this respect, this is a very universalist message, the Ash'ari message of, Insha'Allah, I am a believer. Very universalist, because it says, to everyone, that we are all works in progress. All of us are under dawah, are called upon to, to, to come to belief. Fafirru ila Allah, to come to Islam. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, aminu. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. Oh, believers, believe, continue to believe. Build up your belief, protect your belief. Because, as if Allah is saying that not only say you know, that you are Muslims and not yet believers, but also, you know, don't be sure of yourselves. Don't throw your uh, identity politics and your self-image in other people's faces. Uh, throw it into your own face and say, do, you, do I deserve to be called that yet? No. We say, inshallah, I will be here. So we, we uh, again, I, I told you, at the risk of being preachy and, and general, right, we, we have to be good people. That's, I, I believe, our perpetual, simple, basic, simplistic message, but simplistic, but true. See, now, now the new virtue of being simplistic, simplistic is usually you are being overly simple. You are being excessively simple. You are reducing things to, uh, to something that it's more complex than that. But this is how they are recruiting with a simplistic message of falsehood. Therefore, we have to find our ways of having a simplistic, super simple message of truth. You see? To just to counter that. Uh, that because this is how the way discourse is conducted nowadays, in order to bring people over to either the, the bad side, or therefore those who want to protect ourselves. You cannot just, you know, have you know academic articles and the redefinitions of this and that with a hundred footnotes anymore? It's the time is running out, and every day, every new day is some new disaster on a grand scale, and people are falling into the nets of uh, shaitan as as if they have no protection uh, anymore. So we need to go back to basics. We cannot turn youngsters off of religion in the name of tradition and do or else, and this is how we are, because they do not believe that anymore. They are exposed to too many uh, new tunes to be charmed by the same old broken record that has become even to ourselves, because we are not caring to reinvestigate the meanings of what we are believing or following anymore. The meanings that creation is for the sake of mercy. We are discussing today why Allah Most High in the Fatiha repeated Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. He repeated it because the Fatiha, the first verse is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Again, this is a virtue in the Shafi'i Masa because Shafi'is believe that, that the first verse is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, mashallah. Which makes this, uh, the second mention of Bismillah ar-Rahim, which makes the mention of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim later a second mention of mercy. Why? Because it comes after Rabbil Alameen. Rabbil Alameen. The nurturer and cherisher of the words. The one who brought up the words, what? In the name of mercy. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Under those names. 
So in other words, that the whole secret of, of creation is mercy. The whole key of creation of mercy. The purpose of creation is mercy. So, and no wonder when the prophet, the final prophet, the prophet of prophets, the, the, the leader of prophets, the beloved of the prophets, the prophet Muhammad, peace be, be upon him, came and was named mercy, mercy to the birds. So it is Alameen, Alameen. And it is Anas, the Lord, Allah, the God of mankind, of all of mankind. This universal is. And now we have a message that turns things back topsy turvy, just as the old pagan traditions have been turned upside down by the Prophet for the betterment of mankind, but now they are being turned back upside down for the worsenment of mankind. In the name of religion, the supreme perversion, in the name of religion, Allahu Akbar, it's like the mask of da'wah, the mask of calling people to Islam, uh, but it's masking the wolf behind. And a wolf in sheep's clothing, using religion as its sheep's clothing. And that was all the described by the Prophet in his hand. They will be standing at the gates of hellfire, calling, summoning people. And they will be reciting Quran and speaking the best speech in the Hadith and the Quran. Memorizing and reciting just like the Khawarij of old. First Khawarij. First Khawarij were awliya in comparison to the Khawarij of our time. And yet those first Khawarij were awliya friends of Allah, in, in comparison to the Khawarij of, of our times, those first Khawarij killed the best of mankind in their time. Killed right Sayyidina Ali, radiallahu anhu. And his killer considered it his most pious act that he had done in his whole life. To his last breath, that killer. To his last breath, they never come back. They are far gone. And because they are followers of extremist ways of thoughts that are uh, that are uh, just completely closed up, walled up. And this is very appealing, you see, uh, to uh, people who, are, uh, who want something that is incontrovertible and just, that is absolute. They are in search of absolutes. So they want something that uh, Absolute, and that ends also all debate. And the best way to end all debate also is to, to exit this, this life, because there's no discussion after that. So they, these such acts of, uh, that is despair, the despair of, uh, of any uh, conversation or dialogue or progress or, uh, or, or search or growth, because they, they have found it. They have found it, now they want to end it, after they have found it. Because if there's any chance uh, to, uh, to continue, then that means doubt might come and a way back from that. They don't want that. So therefore, it is a nihilistic way, an anarchistic and nihilistic way. And it is an enmity to mankind and to all the values of mankind, and mostly the greatest value of mind also, and uh, through which Allah is calling us to reflect. So no wonder they are not people of kalam, they are not people of discussion, or jidal hasan, of good exchange and debate and mutual communication, never, never, no communication at all. To the point that though the ex extremists of yesterday are distancing themselves from the extremists of today. Allahu Akbar, what greater proof that we have of the, yani the, the hadith of the Prophet every new day is going to get worse. Every new day is going to get worse and worse and worse. And it's going to be chunks upon chunks and layers of darkness. The fitness will be such. And the one who is sitting is better than the one who is standing, the one who is standing better than the one walking, but the one who is walking better than the one who is running. So stay away from that. So that the address to the women, وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِ كُنَّا Stay in your homes, address, addresses men now. Now if they stay in their homes, that is the best. Meaning in the sense of do not enter any 
such movements, any such you know, debates. But the thing is that it, they have entered our homes. And they are recruiting us through that. SubhanAllah. So the way out is, again, zikr. To be good people. If we do not avail ourselves of the armor of zikr, that is the best of our tradition. And again, this, I think, is the best way to make good men and good women go back to those ways of, uh, of self-protection that our shuyukh are uh, telling us and not to be so rigid when it comes to the externalities of our roles in society as long as the purpose and the way is to be good human beings then there will be a way out even if the hijab is not worn properly or if uh, uh, a handshake takes place uh, with the wrong person or something. These are not, these are, in comparison to the crimes that are offered as an option, of course, this is, this is it's not a, an option to, to take the first. It is an obligation. And if, if it is a sin, uh, Allah Most High would, would be placing us in an impossible situation. See, that to be biased today is to, to do that, to be like that? Never. Impossible. It goes without saying, but we have to say it, and we have to, 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 to communicate that message to those most in, at risk of being recruited. But no, your religion does not command you to do that, my son, my daughter. So, be happy and be relaxed because and be music. And we are we are called to spread the surur, gladness into the hearts of uh, of each other. Surur and gladness. This is a mark of belief. Of Iman. How are, are we going to do that if ev ev everything we <laughs> we are saying is that religion is uh, is to be like this, or else you are going to end up dead? or to kill. Someone was asked, was saying that, uh, a student was saying, is it halal to kill non-Muslims? They think that religion now orders that. What's the difference between that and those who sacrificed human beings to their gods? Sacrificing human beings to their gods. Is this what you think that uh, Allah, the Rabb al-Alamin al-Rahman al-Rahim is calling to? At least read the Asma Allah al-Husna. So, you see what, which one of those names uh, is, is calling onto them. None of them. How do we as Muslims navigate the challenges facing men and women in the family? Again, to, I am I'm telling myself I have not been good. If I have problems in the family, it, it means that I have not been good. I am the first one to uh, recognize my uh, guilt. I think that self-examination is the way to, to navigate those issues inside the family. To be good human beings, to be uh, a good person, and to recognize our faults, that will help make us a better father, a better husband, a better wife, a better daughter, a better son and the better mother. This is the simple question, the simple answer. I'm sure that more can be said. And, uh, perhaps in the West now. now. In the West, you see, again, again the false sense of freedom, uh, working together, that false sense together with the ego, might tell people that the only way out is to leave, because I have other options outside the family, and so divorce will increase. But divorce is increasing even in Muslim countries. The end all and uh, giving up and walking out. <coughs> and this is why, although it is allowed, but Allah hates it, because it is not the best way for us. The problems are a test for the believers. And if we approach it in this way, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is working on us and working with us. Yani lifting us up if we decide to, to 
solve it inside without, without breaking it. Uh, so uh, that's, I think, if we set our goals to just advise ourselves and others to just uh, dis discard divorce as an option, put it out of your mind. Think of it well. Train yourselves to think of it even before the times of crisis. That divorce is not an option because Allah hates it. And right now it is so much on the rise. It means Allah hates it more and more. It doesn't mean that you know, uh, it's going to improve uh, once we go over the limit and Allah will hate it less. No. So if this kind of phenomenon is on the rise, we, we should link it, spiritually speaking, with the problems of the, all the other problems of the Ummah and the whole world. The way to fix that is to just determine to, to go against the flow of that. Again, not to, uh, not to go with the flow. Now, because now tradition, the tradition of the West is dictating to us, now be free, walk out, and uh, start over, or be on your own. The uh, Prophet, upon his blessings and peace, said that marriage with a free woman brings out the best. And what is that behind that hadith? Because a free woman is not going to accept what a slave woman will accept. A free woman will bring out the best because she will be more demanding, more uh, exacting, and bring out excellence. It means that we are. It is not just a a pleasure ride, and uh, it's not uh, uh, lording it over the other. We have been acting like that because we have used the cover of tradition again to exonerate ourselves as men and uh, get ourselves out of the hook. So again, to, to discount tradition that is, goes against our grain, especially when it is against our egotistical interests. But this is part of what is meant, surely, by the directive of trying to be better human beings and better Muslims as well. And to doubt ourselves when it is not solving our problems, it means look at the way that you look at your relationship with Allah Most High. Could the decline in men assuming their traditional roles lead to a misapplication of their masculinity in society, resulting in greater violence? A decline in men assuming their traditional roles, if it leads to a misapplication, it means they are not assuming their good traditional roles. Yani their traditional roles as self-sacrificing breadwinners who are uh, relying on God-given wisdom in order to direct the way that they communicate with uh, spouse, family members, uh, community, and the world. Uh, this in itself is a program that, as we said, we, we, have, we have a challenge with that. But if what is meant by tradition here is uh, machism or uh, to be, uh, this is what men do in the, in the sense of getting ourselves off the hook, because everyone does that, you see, uh, the way of sexual promiscuity, for example, it used to be a crime in uh, in the Western law. In, uh, I mean, adultery, fornication, but no longer, no longer. So, uh, if we get our cues from that, then we're on the wrong track. We should be saying no. We are. We we consider it something wrong consider it something wrong and there is no way that uh, this can change, that can be changed by man because it is the way of the Prophet Wasallam. But um, misapplication of masculinity in the sense that you are not being a man if you, don't, for example, uh, growing up as a Christian in Lebanon, the, uh, the question is put to teenagers, to m male teenagers, from the time of puberty until until they get married. Do you have a girlfriend? 
And so uh, to claim proudly from the rooftops that you are now a fornicator is seen therefore as a positive value in such a society. Because then they are able, they are able finally to answer yes and then be left alone or be honored and so forth. So this is where we are, uh, we are going. I mean, this is not masculinity. Or to uh, raise our fists at the drop of a hat, traffic light, the name of uh, honor. It's not honor, this is not masculinity. Then in the end, uh, the head of the family is gone, what, because of a tiff? So is this masculinity, is this wisdom, is this human humanity? No. Therefore, I mean, to learn the ways of uh, the Prophet gentle, his gentleness. Sayyidina Anas السلام, he said, you know, I was his servant for 10 years. He never raised his voice to me. Never raised his voice. But we raise our voice on any given morning for a hole in a sock or a missing ingredient in the kitchen, God forbid. And uh, then uh, that's if, if the man if he has a restraint, but is, if he's masculine, then he might even raise more than his voice. So, um, I think uh, the resulting in greater violence, uh, yes, uh, in the world. I'm sure that uh, if, we, if we are becoming greater lovers of the Prophet, like uh, someone was saying, you know, to keep respect for the Prophet will bring peace to the world. And another way also, this uh, one from my chef, my teacher, Maulana Shem Nazim, said the fruit of real practicing is peace. The fruit of real practicing is peace. If we want to check if we are really practicing our religion, the fruit of it will be peace. Peace in our heart, peace in our demeanors, at home, at work. And lack of anger, even internal anger, it might be someone who never raised his voice, but has internal anger, an internal dialogue of anger with himself, with others, with the world, and with issues in the world even. SubhanAllah, uh, happening at the other end of the world, and I catch myself time and again in any and all of those scenarios. I'm saying, speaking, hear from experience when it comes to describing negativity. I, I cannot say the same about positive advice. I'm saying, I'm saying positive advice is directed to myself. But as for the description of the negativity that is obligating us to follow positive advice, that description is coming from experience, I must say. So what advice would you leave, would you have particularly for women desiring to excel in their knowledge and faith in this society? And to, first of all, to, for men and women to keep salat and the obligations of Islam. And uh, traditionally the times for, the time for paying zakat is the month of Ramadan, to take that extremely seriously. And expect goodness from that. Because a drop of uh, unpaid zakat in our income means, a drop, uh, means that our income has been mixed with haram, for sure. And uh, food that is bought from that, cooked and served, or something like that, we don't want that. We serve for even for strangers at our table, let alone ourselves and our families. But to take that seriously, zakat and uh, Fasting to continue with the good impetus of Ramadan, uh, as we heard in the khutbah today, the Jamia Ali ibn Abi Talib, mostly, and to continue with that uh, good, uh, good habits that Ramadan instills in us, and to, to make every every month a month of fasting, three days at least, uh, or Mondays and Thursdays, and so forth, that helps clear clear our thoughts. Even from the first moment of evolution, our thoughts become clearer. An inspiration comes to the heart that is uh, requesting, that is searching out something, is there is a problem. And 
this, this is what we are asking for, to have clarity of thought when it comes to addressing those issues. There is uh, too much on our minds, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can lift that in uh, kind of quicker, quicker than anything. Uh, but we, we need to follow the ways of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is the real, the real tradition that we should reconnect with at all times. And how would the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have approached this just in the same way as the, the, the verse of uh, striking that is brought up either by Islamophobes or by wife beaters, subhanAllah. Uh, extreme speed, extreme speed at all times. We are seeing that all the time. Extreme speed. And co extremes are cooperating whether they decide it or not or coordinate it or not. They, they are cooperating and uh, presenting the wrong picture. This is not our tradition, but rather the way of Prophet Sallallahu as embodied and represented by Awliya Allah, the men and women who are friends of Allah, who are, uh, have piety in their lives and practical advice at all times. And it seems to me that yani, it is more, it is, sim it is simpler than we think, really. There is a lot to say because our minds are, are clouded over, but in reality it's just be good, do your best, Trust, uh, trust your hearts, our hearts as believers, as people have said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu are functioning organs of communication and inspiration. That uh, is what the Prophet sallallahu uh, taught us istikhara exactly for that. Istikhara, the consultation prayer, and uh, our shuyukh in Sham told us that make every non-fard salat a consultation prayer as well as the sunnah that you are fulfilling. Because you can build up sunnah upon sunnah. Again, the Shafi'i Mazhab is extremely practical in that. We are thankful for that. More knowledge we have of different Mazhabs mean more leeway for goodness. The people of knowledge are the people of leeway. This is a rule of the Salaf al-Salih. Laith ibn Sa'd and others of the Salaf al-Salih. And Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, the pious fifth righteous guided uh, Caliph said that I would not have loved it more if the Sahaba had not differed among themselves in the way that they applied the directives of the Holy Prophet because they understood them in different ways and Allah wanted it and wished it that way and the Prophet validated it when he saw in his own lifetime such differences and gave validated the approaches of him. so it means that they were doing their best and uh, acting with their hearts as believing men and women, trusting their instincts in that. And anyone who would have said at that time, no, follow tradition, do not innovate, uh, my brother, they, they would have uh, dismissed it with a gentle smile or with a, uh, a reaction perhaps uh, that is stronger, but I mean, that, it would not have broken ties, it would not have created schisms, and uh, Anathema and takfir, no. They were nobler than that, and the Ummah is richer than that, and more accepting. So values that, again, are universalist and easily understandable by others, including non-Muslims. This is our ma'roof. And inshallah, Allah is, uh, is our trust and uh, our guarantee. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so if if that is our intention, and if we are doing our obligations scrupulously, and we are taking account of ourselves at the end of the day, if only for a couple of minutes at least, and uh, to recognize at all times that, oh Allah, I'm a sinful servant. But I also recognize, I confess that I'm a sinner, but I confess that you are our Lord who is all giving. MashaAllah. Like the Salaf al-Salih on their deathbed. They would be at times in, in, in dire straits. They would feel in dire straits. Because the deathbed also provides a clarity that is uh, at, the, at the limit of what is bearable for people who recognize their sins and see them all in front of their eyes like that before death. And so they're saying, I, don't be, I, I can see that I have nothing that I can rely on. But you are my Lord. But, la ilaha illallah, that's all I can say. They would say like that. So, subhanAllah, they would say the kalimat al-shahada 
out of necessity, as a protection of sins that they would see before their faces. So taking account that is a sign of a healthy Iman, feeling like a hypocrite, that is a sign of a healthy Iman. Not to think that you are, you are good, you are A-OK, -okay. you are the best in the room, you are the best in the society. No, this, this is a sign of a true munafiq, a hypocrite. But to say to ourselves, yeah, I feel like a hypocrite, I am not the best, I am far from it. In reality, uh, there is not one point in my life in which I was not hurting someone. That, inshallah, will be the, the, the way of redress for the good man, recognizing his faults. And the best thing that he might have in his life would be a good woman who is by his side at that time. And then the sky is the limit, inshallah, in hasanat, in good deed. There is no limit. There's no limit, and inshallah it will be accepted and it will be raised up with salat of the Prophet and zikr. Allah accept from us, this is our intention, we turn back to him with all our small minds and we are saying from, from our graves where we know that we will end up, you know, he will forgive us. Grant us mercy and to hold the whole ummah in this short life and make us better men and women and help us, help us with these issues, to fix what is wrong in our ummah. And this way we can help others as well. And others might come in droves again and enter Islam in droves again and again, just as predicted. Because this is the religion of goodness. It's not a religion of, of otherwise. Otherwise it is not a religion. It is a religion of goodness and nothing but. Sine qua non, as they say. And uh, astaghfirullah for taking too long. I went through the questions, I hope I covered uh, most of the basic points that uh, I was meant to. And I ask for your uh, forgiveness. Thank you. <coughs> Alhamdulillah, uh, I'm sure we've all been, um, uh, uh, been able to um, try and digest the, the many points um, of reflection of, uh, of, of the Shaykh uh, on this particular issue and uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect him, to preserve him and to grant him strength and the ability to continue to uh, impart his wisdom wherever he goes and with his permission we'd like to open up the, uh, the floor uh, for some questions inshallah if, uh, if possible So inshallah, um, if we have any questions, first from the uh, from the brothers, and then we can go to the sisters as well. They can pass on the mic. Society today, and then um, through, through what you have um, mentioned, we have also the uh, the concept of tradition, which uh, Islam finds very very valuable. But you have told us that as well, uh, tradition has been given to us for a purpose, as in to fulfill higher objectives. And it appears that tradition today can be used to, uh, you know, in fact, to to uh, oppress. To, to be a cause itself for the oppression of women. But at the same time, we don't want to call for the leaving of tradition. Um, why I say that is because there are other groups, uh, let's say, um, you know, groups which fight for the rights of women, and they actually mention as one of the, one of the causes of oppression of women is traditional gender roles. Um, so, uh, so how do you respond to that? Because for, from one perspective, Groups like these, um, you know, women's rights groups, they they call for the lifting of oppression of women, 
but at the same time, they call for the leaving of traditional gender roles. Um, so that's the first question. And then related, the second related question as well. So let's say, let's say we do call for the leaving of, uh, let's say I'll make it, I'll make the wording extreme, the leaving traditional gender roles, but calling for more, uh, high, I guess, higher objectives, such as mercy towards women. And um, how do we then respond to uh, to people who say, oh, you're not focusing on the fifth now. Now we're just all about general rules, but but obviously we have the uh, big practice, which is very important, such as, you know, we know people that are very maqasid, they, they focus on the maqasid, and then they leave the fifth, for example. So how do we then respond to, to that? So, is that correct? Yeah, they are interrelated, aren't they? And uh, some uh, reformers consider that we must do away with all the hadiths that contradict the reformist program, calling for mercy, for greater uh, inclusion of uh, and, and beyond the traditional gender roles uh, that are perceived as uh, obscurantists or regressive and so they, their solutions sometimes are against what everyone is prepared to accept and what no one should accept really because they're, they're doing away with one or another of the principles and foundations of Islam as a solution we for example they, they will uh, they will uh, reinterpret in ways that are unheard of Quran or Hadith, or they will do away with some of the rulings of, uh, of uh, Sharia or some of the Hadiths, and, uh, and so forth. Or they will say that these verses are no longer applicable today. They will uh, try to bring in new ways of uh, you know, forcing their reform through, despite uh, what the text says, but in the terms that they themselves uh, are dictated. On the other hand, uh, there are some also who are insisting on finicky points. I mean, they are too punctilious and perhaps missing the big picture, even when they realize that those in the other perspective are weak in fiddle and are sometimes perceived as being. Uh, are miss, as missing some aspects of fiqh or misunderstanding them, uh, so they they come up with a, a fiqhi argument versus a maqasid argument. Although the maqasid is uh, is an eminently acceptable concept by everyone, faqih and, uh, and non-specialists uh, as well, and the maqasid are larger than uh, and can be understood to be you know, the objectives the the. the overarching objectives of the religion are very much in line with the, I mean, the primary uh, objectives of uh, religion even in a, in a generic sense I mean, that we are, we are supposed to be uh, worshipping Allah, obeying Him, being merciful to one another. So there is this vertical dimension of worshipping and believing in Allah and this horizontal dimension of being good human beings. Not just to be philanthropists, but not believe, and not just to believe, but then to walk roughshod over over humanity and creation. You know, the name of Tasfir, Then we're going to now dominate nature, and animal world, etc. And to think that we are kings and the Khalifa of the world in that sense, sometimes it is like a tyrannical approach. It's not right. We again, the character sometimes is the convincing uh, argument of the speaker. If we, see, if, we, if we denote that there is a, uh, an approach through the language of awliya Allah, I mean, and uh, the language of Islam, <coughs> this is what the Ummah is accustomed to, and this is what the Ummah will come over to. We are missing leadership. We have a lot of thinking heads, and. Uh, but sometimes it is like uh, dry. The communication is like ink on paper, but it's not penetrating hearts. And the arguments might be brilliant. You might have intellectuals here and there, 
and academics, but uh, they don't talk to one another. They don't, and uh, they might have harsh words for the Sufis, and uh, sometimes the reverse. Uh, but usually, uh, the Sufis are a critique for uh, being, uh, yani overly spiritual and not practical uh, enough. But I think that uh, uh, we, again, uh, we have to take the best of everything, what everything has to offer, and try to see the positive message in these, uh, these new solutions. Uh, even if, if, the, uh, if the message of the Maqasid uh, scholars, or the message of the Islamization of knowledge no, uh, scholars, uh, all of these might seem too compartmentalized. So if you don't belong to that uh, uh, new approach, you feel that it's not my, uh, I, I, I don't agree with their ideas. You might agree with their ideas and not know it. You just don't speak their language. You will never discover. You will never know. I've learned a lot from uh, sharing time in different uh, spaces, even some sometimes places where uh, I'm not welcome. And yet, you know, uh, I have learned from that. We have to humbly take the best of everything. And when we are called upon to cooperate or to contribute, to do our best. That's all that we can hope for. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall send, shall send uh, uh, leadership, uh, make leadership emerge here and there. Through service, might be anonymous. Uh, leadership, but usually it is prominent, or otherwise. And some of the audience said it is through service that I, uh, Allah gave me a mind opening, through service of, uh, of, of community. That service might, uh, might be even in the political sense nowadays. And it might be again through the unlikeliest of, uh, of partners. Allah is opening ways that are defying our previous models of thought, and the way we can produce goodness for society and for the Ummah as well. At the risk of being called bad names by traditional bound people, in the sense that we have, we don't do that, we, you know, this is like uh, or traitors, like that. SubhanAllah. So, There, is, there, there are overarching problems, like people leaving Islam also. Is it better to, to try your best and not ask about anything? The, the dying person who is drowning, you, you pull out their hand. They're not going to ask where you come from, what you are wearing, uh, uh, what you believe in. And this is how, where we are right now. So, might be oversimplifying, but let's not be also too essentialists and uh, to punctilious must be practical we, in the world of life and death and we can go any moment we ask to be going in the best way and husn al khatima another question came about the hadith of the majority of inhabitants of hell uh, being women which was spoken by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to motivate them uh, to give sadaqah and uh, zakat and at that time they responded uh, you know with superlative generosity in the mosque and Sayyidina Bilal who was, who was taking in all of the jewelry and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked why uh, would they end up in hell because he replied they uh, they deny the goodness from their mates that they, you know, the ashir, meaning the spouse, uh, even if uh, that goodness has been coming, but because of uh, a problem arises and they are unhappy, they might, uh, uh, you know, lash back in anger. But this is, this is a problem also with men as well. So how come men uh, were not said to be the majority of the inhabitants of hell? I, I like to think it's because that statistically there's more women born than men in humanity. So that's it. And the Prophet ﷺ was using tawriya 
for a double entendre at that time. He did not mean it because of their gender, but because it just happened to be majority. But in reality, all mankind is asking, acting like that in this respect. Yaqfurna al-Ashir applies also to men. Yaqfurna al ashira They deny. They, you uh, have always been bad to me. If they want to complain about one thing, it becomes universal and absolute, and they want to break up. And men, uh, men and women act like that in fits of anger. And so anger is, is like kufran uh, al-ni'ma. It clouds judgment, and we just deny goodness, and it, it clouds out to Allah uh, with injustice. It is an inju unjust behavior. But this is not typical of, of, of women alone. Men as well act like that. However, women have, happen to be the majority of, of human beings. That's, I think this, and at that, in that context, he was addressing the women, you see? And he wanted to motivate them to act, do something good. Clear yourself from, uh, from that charge at this very moment. And then uh, they immediately responded by just you know, taking their bracelets, their gold, and throwing it into the uh, nobly and generously. So, and they became an example for uh, humankind also. Although they are dependent on that. This is their wealth. They wear their wealth and their protection. In case of widowhood, war, uh, or disease, or whatever, right? The, 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 what insurance are they going to fall back on? Uh, what father will take them back, especially in late age, when they have disappeared, or uh, brethren or sisters that are married and or they have their own needs, etc. This is their gold, is their house, their property, their their uh, their protection, and their roof over uh, their old age. Yet they gave it away. See, trusting in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, such are not of the inhabitants of Al Fire. But the Prophet was giving a general example. And he put it in uh, gender, uh, he couched it in, in terms of gender. But it is not limited to one gender. It was just the need of the moment, and it is a double entendre of the Prophet. Allah knows best. Mawlana Sheikh Hisham, our Sheikh, a teacher, may Allah preserve him, he answered one time that same question by saying to a group of women, it's because the Prophet. Is the intercessor, and he wants to, he wants to intercede for uh, more. So he said, I will be interceding for more women than men. And they, uh, they replied, Billahi malik. And they were so happy. They came out uh, laughing and, and congratulating each other, and so happy because of that answer. When they had come in angry, one, I mean, not angry, but meaning tense to ask that question, and almost. You know, relate, uh, relate. but that also comes into the fact that the, the shafa'a of the Prophet وسلم, because the people of Iman are not people of hell fire. It's not their role, they are people of paradise, they are Ahl So, but the Prophet وسلم, loves to intercede and wants to intercede for his own. So, we are counting on that. We are counting on that, just like. Well, we hear a story of uh, the would-be murderer of the Prophet ﷺ, who became his greatest lover at that time. After they entered Islam, after the Prophet ﷺ put his hand on their chest, you know, as they were holding the sword, or, or they had that in their mind. And it happened more than once. It happened when it, in the Battle of Hunayn, it happened in the Fath of Mecca, as he was circumambulating, they turned around, and his would-be murderer had his, his knife ready. And I said to him, what are you thinking about? He said, nothing. I think of Allah, I'm making zikr. I guess he come here, put his hand on his chest. And another one at Hunayn also. And another one visited him in Medina with a poison sword. He said, why are you wearing your sword around your, your neck? For what? He said, nothing, I have no protection. He come here, put his hand on his chest, he read like that. And then at that time, they would say, one after another, in those different reports, I became the greatest lover was worried for the process more than anyone else because they had thought that it was easy to get him they were just waiting for the propitious moment 
So now they were worried that someone else might have it. So they became most concerned. Don't you wish that you were uh, like that? Subhanallah, <laughs> that you were close to the Prophet in that way. That, uh, we do not wish for the first state, but we certainly wish for the result. It happened for a would-be murderer. So we are happy in dunya and akhirah, the Prophet ﷺ intercedes for us, makes dua for us, and is giving up. We must put that hadith that causes us a question in Islam, that same perspective. It is a perspective of rahmah, willy-nilly. Find a way to understand it that way. That Allah will not hold us to task for understanding things in an all too merciful way. I do not think. Because he has called himself, he has called himself first and last, all merciful, all merciful, all merciful. Rahman and Rahim, they mean the same thing. Using a different cognate to, 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 to drive that home to us. So if we find a non merciful aspect, it means that our understanding is being challenged to put it to work in the general perspective of his school of the Quran, and he was mercy to the worlds, and he is Shafi' al Mudnibin, and he is Rahmat al And inshallah, uh, we will be enlightened. Uh, and I, I hope that uh, these two types of approach that I gave is to access to that in this respect to this hadith. That has been heard of, of course. Uh, you know, with feminism and so forth. It must not be literalistic. The Prophet ﷺ, time and again, was not literalistic. He said to a woman one time, an old woman uh, who was, uh, was with him, that, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, no one was, uh, old women will not enter paradise. So she was sad, she was dejected. And then the Prophet ﷺ said to her, means that you will enter young. You will enter young. So what, what he was saying in the first uh, moment was a tawriya, it was a double entendre. It was not meant literally. Prophet Sallallahu is telling us, don't be too literal. One time he asked Aisha, is there any lamb left? She said, only the shoulder is left in the pot. See, they had made a big lamb, sacrificed a lamb or two, and he said, any lamb left? He said, the sh only one shoulder is left. He said, everything uh, is left except the shoulder. Everything is left except the shoulder. So he, he, he changed it around. He think in terms of akhirah, in terms of akhirah. See, I asked the question in terms of dunya, for you to understand in terms of dunya, but I'm now telling you in terms of akhirah, everything is left. The only thing that is not left is the shoulder, uh, because it has not been eaten yet, so it will not be counted yet as a sadaqah. It will not be counted yet as a hasana. It will not be part of the baqiyat as salihat yet. You know, I must turn it, think in terms of baqiyat as salihat. The women who heard this hadith immediately acquired baqiyat as salihat and are laughing at now, laughing at us now from the paradise. They are hearing our say, We are long beyond that now, that issue. Allah <coughs> The microphone is inside for the women. If there's a question that wants to that, that wants to come through to the shape. Facebook and um, the likes. So really, 
is that how do we, when we've got certain people in the community who are going out there and saying, forgiveness is enough. We've forgiven for the last 30 years and we think you're too pacifist. We don't want to forgive anymore, we want action. Can you advise on that? No, we continue to forgive for uh, 40 more years, so that the total will be 70 years. <laughs> After that, maybe, but 30 years is nothing. 30 years is like yesterday. No, we must continue to forgive. And uh, uh, it is, uh, the, the forgiveness is itself, uh, you see, forgiveness is one of the goals, one of our goals in any, in any case. Forgiveness. We are always asked to forgive in order to be forgiven. This in itself is worship, you see. Uh, so forgiveness for us is not one of two options, uh, the other being non-forgiveness. Non-forgiveness is uh, not worship. It's, it's a pure negativity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, forgive even when you have the right to exact revenge. In Sharia terms, talian and retaliation is permitted, indeed, and uh, reprisals within limits, you know, whether in Hulud law, uh, criminal punishment law, or in uh, uh, the conduct of war, for example, but there are limits, there are limits. See, so, for example, if orchards are burnt by the enemy, then uh, the Muslims may burn orchards as well uh, to show, to exact their uh, right. But if women and children are killed by the enemy, Ibn Qudama said, we are not at liberty to kill their women and children at war. We are not. We are not. So, Qisas, or retaliation, or uh, Italian law uh, behavior is not across the board like that, uh, uh, absolute, in absolute terms, you see. And Sheikh uh, uh, Yusuf al Qaradawi has a book on uh, jihad also, which uh, was published in 2009, I believe. 1,600 pages, it's a huge work. Uh, we could to have that translated because it has beneficial, very great benefits. And he said, because, see, we have strictures, we have rules that stop us from excess. They don't, they may not have, but we do. So we, we are bound in that. Even in, even in Kilit, otherwise, that Israf is not permitted. So, and anger for the sake of Allah and the Prophet Sallallahu yes, but that is prone, or that has limits also as well. And the Prophet Sallallahu was saying, La ta'udha to the man, three times, La ta'udha, La ta'udha, like that. So, uh, again, uh, anger is, 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 can be seen and observed in much and much of what goes on nowadays, especially when we are exposing ourselves to the the discourse uh, of internet and media and that kind of talk uh, which also is dehumanized by anonymity the anonymity of comedian uh, permits more and more dehumanization so we do not know what is behind it could be uh, another human being it could be a sick human being it can be a human being that uh, has no belief in God or man and has given up even on their own uh, values and ethics, and that is engaging you. You are now engaging in a very dark matter. That is, if it's a human being, it can be also a shaitan. You know? And you should see also in the French, uh, how uh, the French uh, media, the French uh, social media are, are extremely much more venomous and inventive in their vocabulary of uh, hatred. But it's hatred of humankind. It finds a, an, a, a, an exit or a practice, it finds a field in Islamophobia, but uh, it's hatred of humankind. It's just that Islamophobia is the 
uh, the uh, misanthropy of the day. So misanthropy of the day, just as the the person who is mentally sick might uh, disguise their uh, act of uh, uh, of uh, killing people as a, a religious act, and it is misinterpreted willingly and embraced by the media because it sells better, uh, because it is the fad of the day, also. So there's different factors at play, none of which serve truth. And you are engaging that? You are hoping to turn the tide uh, through uh, dialectic? <laughs> arguing? You are arguing with what? Go to your zikr, go to your salat, your prayer rug, sit after uh, wudu and the two rak'at of, uh, of turning back to Allah, of salat al-haja, of salat al-istikhara, of salat shukr, of uh, salat tawbah of anything that will turn back to Allah with your empty hands expressing your needs, reflect and turn to your heart and see what uh, pearls and coral and gems will come to your heart to say, be happy, be uplifted, you are under protection, uh, I know what is going on, we know what is going on, Allah knows what is going on, Allah, Sami'un Basir and Sami'un Ali. So uh, I think that if we are going to spend one hour arguing, or even in, in fact reading, uh, even academic discourse on Islam is very dry and very anti-Islamic, we should also spend equal or double or more amount of time also refreshing ourselves with zikr, because that is uh, where our learning comes from and our inspiration as well, reflecting upon Quran. and. Uh, Inshallah, we will, we will be uh, well advised in that regard. Because we are in need of good consultation and good istikhara and, and good exchanges. Otherwise, it's going to be just anger against anger, ego against ego, and they feed upon one another in order to grow in uh, negativity. So it should not, uh, it should not help in that. Uh, as for hijab, uh, the question is asked about uh, making it look beautiful often at the cost of compromising how the hijab is worn. I think the greater priority would be security and safety. If hijab means uh, victimization and one has to be outside the home in the street uh, and calls for uh, it, there is a risk of a hate crime taking place, sometimes. Uh, also, uh, the victim might not even be Muslim, but be perceived as Muslim. Like a Sif man wearing a turban, or a, a Coptic priest, for example, because of their long beard, or Egyptian priest.